Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you might be. My name is Alex Cooley. I am the current director of the Harriman Institute here at Columbia University and a professor of political science at Barnard College. It is a great pleasure uh, to welcome you uh, this morning to our virtual event, which is um, a book talk on slow anti-Americanism, social movements, and symbolic politics in Central Asia uh, by Professor Edward Schatz. Um, the, uh, the book itself is um, a work that has been, I would say, a long time coming, but certainly worth the wait and worth the effort. And so uh, it's just uh, really terrific that uh, uh, Ed is here today um, to, um, um, to reflect on, on, on what has been uh, an, an important and, and, and uh, a project that has evolved um, um, significantly over the last years and, and is finally baked in. And then uh, today he will be in dialogue uh, with uh, Colleen uh, Wood, who is a PhD candidate here at Columbia in the Department of Political Science, um, who conducts research on state society relations in Central Asia and social mobilization and civic engagement. Um, her work has been funded by the National Science Foundation, and some of you might know her through her writing. She's often published in The Diplomat, also Foreign Policy, um, and The Washington Post. Um, so I should also mention uh, Ed's brief bio. He's currently an associate professor of political science at the University of Toronto um, and a specialist in both Eurasia, Central Asia, and ethnographic methods. And his previous books include Paradox of Power, The Logic of State Weakness in Eurasia, and Political Ethnography, What Immersion Contributes to the Study of Power. So the format for today is in less than a minute, I'm gonna hand it off to Colleen, who's going to engage Ed in a series of uh, questions and answers. I would encourage everyone in the audience um, who has questions, please do join us. Use uh, the question and answer tab. Um, if you have a question, um, put it in there. Uh, we will go to questions in about 35, 40 minutes and we'll try and include as many as we can. Uh, and um, we will aim to uh, finish at about 10, 15 or so, uh, depending on how things go. So uh, Ed, welcome again, Colleen, thanks so much. Um, for uh, reading the book and for engaging Ed, and we'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you so much for the introduction, Alex. And uh, Ed, I'm so excited to talk uh, about your book with you. Um, it was really excellent to read. I mean, as always, well-written, but also really meaty. Um, and I think before getting into some of the substantive questions that I have, I, I kind of wanted to talk through your process of coming up with this really interesting geological metaphor for anti-Americanism. So the slow sedimentation, kind of I could imagine and visualize, you know, a river flowing, um, flowing and the, the, soot, the stuff at the bottom building up. Um, and it was, yeah, a, a metaphor I'd never heard before um, when, when thinking about foreign policy, but I think that is really satisfying in a world where we, not everything is a kind of binary, yes, no, black, white. Um, but beyond the, the geological metaphor, I think also the book is a really fantastic model of patchwork methods. Um, and especially right now for those of us who are grounded uh, in doing research by COVID, um, I thought that the book, the way that you draw on newspaper analysis, survey experiments, focus groups, but also drawing on your really long history of, of going to the region of spending time in different contexts with different people, um, to, to draw on those observations and, and field experience, experience was really fascinating. So I was wondering if you could start by talking through the process in like sewing together, if you will, this patchwork um, story about anti-Americanism. Thanks, thanks, Colleen. Um, and thanks, Alex. I just wanna say at, at the outset, thanks to for, for organizing this. It's, it is great to, um, to, to speak to the audience and to have something to speak about. Alex referred to the long gestation period for the book. Uh, that's a nice way of putting it. Um, but I like to think that actually, you know, it's slow anti-Americanism is, is the title. Uh, the book was kind of a, a, a slow intellectual process in a way. Uh, there were many moments where I had hoped to get it uh, to get it out, but I really think it would have been a different book. 
uh, if I had published this in when I tried to do a first push, which was probably over 10 years ago, don't tell anybody. Um, but, uh, but I think that, that, it, that it bears the, um, uh, the stamp a little bit of, of longer term thinking. And perhaps that, that's what lead, led me to thinking into these kinds of metaphors, right, about the slowness. So let me just kind of back up a little on the assumption that most people will not have, you know, read the book, um, though maybe you should, but I'll offer a, a bit of a teaser, um, which is to say, you know, what, what, what am I trying to say by slow anti-Americanism? Um, so I'll get to the geologic metaphors in a, in a, in a second. Um, but really what I'm trying to do is draw a bit of, of rhetorical distance from sort of normal treatments of anti-Americanism. Um, and by normal, I, what I tend to see is that when it's discussed, and you know, there are all sorts of questions about the suitability of the term and that, and that kind of thing we can certainly chat about. But um, when it's discussed, it, it usually evokes images of you know, firebrand dictators fulminating against the US uh, or of you know, impassioned masses burning flags and these kinds of things. And, and so to me, that, uh, that is, is potentially quite misleading, certainly for the Central Asian context, right? Um, it's misleading in a couple of ways. First of all, if people think about the United States, and this is not first and foremost on everyone's mind, but I try to make the argument that it's a resonant symbol. But people don't think about it in these kinds of terms. Um, it doesn't have this kind of um, it doesn't have this kind of powerful direct impact that you might see in accounts of the Iranian Revolution, let's say, right? Um, or if we look at what animates, you know, Hugo Chavez's um, rants against the United States. I mean, there you could make a, a bit of an argument for the kind of fast anti-Americanism that, um, that I'm trying to distance myself from. Here, what I see is a much more gradual um, set of processes that shift what the United States comes to mean. And so I'm using the United States as a symbol, I actually call it symbolic America. Um, uh, and and I, try to, I try to chart out how there are a whole series of things that happen over the course of the 1990s and into the 2000s that really shift what the United States represents for a variety of different um, actors on the ground, whether they're ordinary people or whether they're social activists, politically um, ambitious uh, people on the ground, whatever their agenda might be, the raw material that is the United States as a symbol uh, has shifted um, over the course of a couple of decades. Okay, and so it's that that's where I tried to deploy the metaphor that's geologic, right? So the idea is that sediment travels in waterways. So there are a lot of uh, there, there are a lot of forces that can begin to shift what the United States as a symbol means, but where it comes from, what well, comes from a lot of different places. Um, and it travels in somewhat predictable ways, just as a river has a, has a course, but it doesn't necessarily mean that any given piece of sediment will stick at a final destination or that it'll have any particular kind of impact. So this is, Alex will recognize this, this is a post tenure project in political science because you know, I'm, I'm, not try, I'm not in the business of predicting, right? I'm trying to account for a, a development that, um, uh, that, that, that I find puzzling and interesting but it's hard to predict how sediment has an impact, um, but it does have an impact. And this is the case that I wanna make um, that uh, just because people aren't burning flags and just because there aren't these firebrand dictators fulminating against the United States, doesn't mean that the shifting image of the United States doesn't have an impact. And so that's this kind of story that I, I want to tell. It's slow, but I think it has, it has a significant impact. Um, we can, unpack with this more if you, if you want to, Colleen, but um, onto the methods question, I, which I think is a, an interesting one because, and an important one, um, this is, you know, a post-tenure book in another way, right? This is where, this is where life kicked in, right? Um, so, you know, I continued to do field work um, over the course of this book, but it was never of the same kind of duration that I, that I um, really had developed a commitment to. In fact, this is this book is motivated a bit by guilt, right? I really feel like you need to be on the ground as much as possible and talk to the widest range of uh, people um, and observe as many things as you as you possibly can uh, in order to have a, a a good sense of the places the places that we end up doing research about. Um, and I was able to go back, you know, every year, sometimes more than once a year, but they were shorter trips, and so. I ended up relying on, on different methods. Um, and so this is born out of necessity. Um, 
you know, in political science, and Colleen, you're probably in the throes of this, right? There's this sort of wisdom, at least in the Western Academy, that, you know, mixing methods is a great thing. And, um, and, and there's sort of a new normal whereby I'm using mixed methods, right? Um, and I think it can be really, really powerful. Um, what I try to do in the, in the book is, is uh, mix methods judiciously and in ways that are where the kind of underlying assumptions of the methods can line up with each other. Because it's one thing to say, you know, I'm going to do a formal model and I'm going to do a, a, a regression and then I'm going to do focus groups. But ontologically or epistemologically, they're just on different planes. They don't necessarily speak to each other. So, so here I tried to, I, I tried to do a bunch of things with an eye to, um, uh, I guess, the judicious mixing. Uh, whether or not it's, it's successful, you know, you can, you can be the judge. But um, I, think that, uh, I think that it was sort of born of somewhat of necessity, but I tried my best to, you know, uh, be as eclectic and as Catholic as, as possible because, you know, uh, it, 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 that was necessary. But, but I guess also one more thing, you know, this is a, a, a fairly uh, complex and even slippery phenomenon, right? Um, if you study it with one, with one single approach, I, I would argue um, you're really going to be missing significant aspects of it, right? Um, and so I think, you know, and, and as I put in the, in the appendix, which is a sort of a methodological discussion, you know, you turn it ever so slightly and it reveals a new facet and, and that new facet might recommend a sort of different methodological approach. So that in a nutshell is what I was up to. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, so I guess then to bring it back to your discussion of like what you were doing substantively with the book, it's kind of exploring um, the, the rise of, of anti-Americanism and the ways that it um, kind of worked as a symbol between society and the state, like that you really push back on the idea that state society relations operate such that, you know, society has public opinion, the state is aware of that public opinion and responds and shapes both domestic and foreign policy. Um, and I think that it makes total sense to push back on that, not one, because most of these um, countries in Central Asia are not democratic, um, that there are not institutions built to channel public demands and public beliefs into policy, or at least not the mechanisms of accountability that we have um, in the West. Um, but um, in, in pushing on this idea that the state and society though are not entirely separate. So for you, you have these three chapters in which you explore um, Islamist organizations, human rights organizations, and labor as examples of kind of groups that operate in the middle um, and are doing the work of translating or uh, translating both between the state's policy but also underlying um, public opinion. And so I kind of wanted to talk through some of these chapters um, and, you know, your logic of, of case selection and the work in um, building evidence to make claims. So wanting to start with a chapter on Islamic trajectories. Um, here you look at the ways that three different um, Islamist groups, Hizb um, Tahrir, the Islamic Renaissance Party in Tajikistan and the Islamic movement in Uzbekistan, the ways that these groups are kind of situated differently and have um, different audiences and draw on the symbolic America to either advance their causes or um, peter out in the case of the Islamic Renaissance Party. Um, but I was wondering as I was reading this um, to try to dig through the, the representativeness of these groups as Islamic identity in Central Asia, um, at least like in terms of being able to make a claim on how symbolic America fits into Islamic identity in Central Asia you know, thinking of, okay, like the people that at least I know and lived with in Southern Kyrgyzstan, if you mentioned the name Hizb ut or Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, there'd be this like gut punch of like, those are the people who invaded Batken. And like, those are the people who are um, Wahhabis, like they are, they're bad Muslims. Like we are not like that. Um, and so just kind of would like to hear your thoughts on how you chose these groups as opposed to say, you know, an organization that maybe represents a broader swath of Islamic identity, such as the, the Muftiat in Kyrgyzstan, so this kind of gongoized um, religious organization that I think, at least, at least in the Kyrgyz context, um, does speak a little bit more to the, the 
public opinion as opposed to this niche um, social organization. So could you talk a bit more about how you chose the Islamic trajectories cases? Great, no, 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 those are, those are, those are great questions. Um, so let me just go back to the, how you sort of framed it initially, the public opinion thing. And uh, you're right, I'm trying to, I mean, public opinion is a challenging thing to study. Um, and that's not really what I'm trying to do, or at least I don't conceptualize it in the way that say public opinion scholars and um, who study uh, democratic context uh, um, uh, conceptualize it. And part of the reason is because, you know, these are authoritarian uh, regimes by, by degree and, you know, with moving parts, but nonetheless authoritarian. So, you know, how do we talk about public opinion and its effect on really very much? Uh, not that it doesn't have an effect, but it's just becomes very challenging to talk about, you know, its, its impact. Um, but in part because, you know, I mean, even in democratic contexts, when we think about foreign affairs and public opinion on foreign affairs, I mean, historically, at least, it's been the case that, um, you know, at, at least research on the United States suggests, and it may be the same in other democratic uh, contexts as, as well, I don't know, um, that, you know, the public tends to defer to its policymakers on foreign policy. Um, that's historically been the case. Again, there are lobbies, there are, like there are a lot of different ways to talk about it, but the public doesn't really have some kind of a direct uh, uh, sort of channel into, into the policymaking circles. It has to be mediated by something like lobbies or, or other kinds of uh, groups. So, so for me to talk about this, the impact of, of what is bandied, being bandied about in social circles or even in people's heads, was really not the public opinion was not going to be the, the sort of conceptual vessel for that for that discussion, and so I wanted to uh, so I looked at social movements and so I used the social movements literature which you know some some people in the audience may be familiar with but even if not I mean the idea is that I mean it may sound strange that there are social movements in Central Asia those who live in Central Asia or study Central Asia know very well that there that there are activists there are uh, organizations there are moving parts. But um, that's not necessarily plain if you just sort of broad brush the region as authoritarian. But absolutely, social movements are, are, are quite active, though they are, um, you know, can be on the receiving end of coercive tactics by, by, by regimes and so on and so forth. But there's enough space there in most of these contexts, not all, um, for, you know, us to see mobilization and how mobilizers use images of the United States in their recruitment or not, as the case may be. And, and the or not part of the story is really what we see in the case of labor mobilization. And, and, and maybe we'll have a moment to get to that. But um, so getting to your question about Islamist mobilization, um, I wanted to look at those um, I mean, there is a selection issue here, right? Because, and the selection issue is, I wanted to look at those that were politic, that clearly had a political agenda. So I call them Islamist trajectories rather than Islamic trajectories, because I think you're absolutely right. If you wanted to do Islamic, that is to say the, the you know, how do, how do ordinary Muslims who are not necessarily interested in politics, how do they imagine the United States and what impact does that have on their lives or their, the way they locate themselves or uh, judge the legitimacy of, of different actors in their society or abroad? Uh, that, would be, that would be a much, much bigger project and, and harder um, in, in a way and would probably require a lot of ethnography, which I think it would be a great idea. And I think that somebody should do that, <laughs> that thing. It was just, um, it was hard. It would have been hard for me to do that. And it would be hard, I think, even if you're on the ground, because how do you begin to, to tackle the totality of, you know, uh, diverse voices that are, that are out there? Um, so I ended up looking at those groups that were politically active, that had, um, that made some claim to be pursuing political agendas motivated by uh, Islamic values. Okay, and so that's really what I'm talking, you know, this is a fairly big basket of Islamist actors, but the most prominent um, organizations, at least at the time of the writing, were these three different different groups. So I think that you're right, there's a question of, you know, um, you know, which ones get politically active. And it may be the case, and I just don't know the answer to this, it may be the case that those that get involved in politics find utility in mobilizing the United States as a symbol and those that are not involved in politics are maybe a little bit less 
concerned with the United States. I don't know. That may be the case. I mean, certainly there are plenty of people on the ground who self-identify as as Muslims. Um, you know, they may be pious by degree or practice by degree, but they, you know, sometimes they 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 would ask me in the course of conversations. Well, it's not really about you know the United States. We have our own problems. It has less to do with the United States than it has to do with you know our own local problems of you know fill in the blank corruption or or lack of jobs or you know um, lack of voice and these kinds of things. Um, but the politically active ones did seem to mobilize the image of the United States. It was sort of it it, it was almost it was almost um, it was almost unavoidable. And so then the question was how they did it. And then you're right, uh, there, there, there are different trajectories there. And I mean, just say one last thing, cause I, you know, I mean, you asked such good questions. I wanna hear more. Um, the, I, I, you know, in the book, I deliberately use the, uh, the plural here, right? Islamist trajectories, because I really do wanna emphasize that there's not just one way to engage the United States and the symbolic material that it that it represents, right? And it's not necessarily because sometimes in the West, certainly in the literature on anti-Americanism, there's this assumption that you know if you're Muslim, you must be critical of the United States. And of course, it can cut that way, um, you know, uh, absolutely. But it can also cut the other way, right? Or at least it could in in the 1990s and into the 2000s. Uh, it became harder. <laughs> to uh, to toe that line uh, as the Islamic Renaissance Party of Tajikistan, you know, found uh, found out um, as it began to evolve, and that's the you know part of the story of that chapter. Yeah, that reminds me of um, teaching in Kyrgyzstan and my students asking, "Are there Muslims in America?" And when I gave out the number of like percentage wise, it's very tiny, but numbers wise, it's like almost as large as your whole country's population of people who who um, observe Islam in, in the U.S. That just the kind of awe of America also has uh, its own kind of Islamic culture. But I think that you're right, and it was never politicized or like that these people weren't and aiming to enter politics on, on that ground. Um, so that makes sense. Yeah. But so you, you brought up labor um, as a kind of like dog that didn't bark is the way that you call it in the book. And, and here you kind of, um, you were just mentioning it as a kind of inverse that, that like labor organizations in Central Asia did not really um, draw on anti-American symbols or framings um, in, in their work. But um, to me, as I was reading this chapter, I was like, okay, like, labor organizations in Central Asia didn't frame their stuff as anti-American, but as I'm, you know, part of a union that is trying to negotiate with Colombia for a contract and tomorrow is ready to go on strike if that isn't fulfilled, you know, reflecting on the state of labor in America, that labor is a dog that doesn't bark here <laughs> largely. Um, so I guess I was kind of um, a little puzzled about like, why should we have expected labor to draw on anti-American symbols or on, on that um, like reservoir of, of symbols and meanings, like given that the US, as you describe it, is a kind of distant hegemon, is not super economically involved. And it, the, to the extent which it is involved in, in local economy and in jobs, you know, I'm thinking of a lot of the, um, or of the projects put forward by the US embassy, you know, draw on this really strong myth of the American dream as a kind of pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And like the programs that the US funds are entrepreneurship, how to start your own business, how to code so that you don't have to go to work. You don't have to go to work in the mines or at the oil fields. Um, but like, you know, the myth of the American dream is incredibly strong here. <laughs> we see that in our own labor organizations and it's also really strong in Central Asia. Um, and so I think like, to me, what I was puzzled about was, you know, for countries where like, where 30% of their GDP comes from remittances in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, like, and those people who those remittances are largely coming from Russia, why would the economic or the labor concerns be about the US um, when, you know, it was a, a fire in a Moscow factory that killed 16 Kyrgyz in 2016. And like that really resonated. People were really frustrated. And I think that that event pushed, um, there was mobilization within Kyrgyzstan to put pressure on authorities in negotiating the um, entering into the Eurasian Economic Union because of that fire and because of the kind of the labor links between Kyrgyzstan and Russia. But when I'm thinking about the US, like the, the conversations that kept coming to mind were those with 
people while I was waiting at a bus stop or taxi drivers or drinking tea at someone's house was just the question is always, can you help me get a visa to go to the US to work? How, what's the process? What can I make if I go to New York and if I am on my tourist visa and I stay, like how hard will it be like to, to find meaningful work that if anything, the sim, like symbolic America in the labor realm is this like land of opportunity. <laughs> like the, the, the myth of the American dream is really well preserved. Um, so I guess I, I, this is not, a, I guess, as direct as a question um, that I had on Islamic directories, but just kind of how did, when you were coming up with labor as a case, how do you reconcile um, the, the at-home symbolic America in, in the US doesn't really push labor to act. So why would we have expected it to do so in, in Central Asia? Okay. Oh, no, that's great. That's absolutely, uh, you know, spot on. Um, so let me see if I can, uh, if I can address the, the series of questions and, 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 and perspectives, because I think they're, I think they're really great. Um, so I would absolutely agree um, that, and it may not come out in the book as, as strong as it should, and I'll and I'll take you know I'll, I'll take the blame for that. But that labor really is in a globally we know this right structurally disadvantaged. And by labor, I'm talking about organized labor. So maybe there's a, a bit of a difference in how we're using that that term. Um, but I mean organized labor. I'm talking about sort of you know just I just taught a seminar for the PhD students yesterday on class. I'm talking about class, right? I'm talking about class-based mobilization. So not just what people do for work and what opportunities they see, but I'm talking about people who are, you know, wage laborers and, um, and face uh, conditions not to their liking and what are their opportunities for mobilizing for, for better health or safety conditions, higher wages, greater job security, these kinds of things. Okay. So, but there's no, there's absolutely no question that uh, it's kind of the understatement of the decade to say that they're structurally disadvantaged, right? This has been a trend across the globe for a couple of decades. Um, so you're, so you're absolutely right. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, I think it goes further than that, though. Um, so I'm going to make your argument even, <laughs> even, even more forcefully, which is to say that, you know, regimes are often in cahoots here, right? So you've got, um, it's certainly in Kazakhstan, and this is the place where you see the most, um, most robust labor mobilization. Organization is a slightly different term, but mobilization. I mean, you certainly, you see wildcat strikes, you see, you know, of lots of different sorts of activities, uh, even if they're not, they operate in sort of a legal gray zone uh, because of the, what the Kazakh authorities do. And that's, and that's the story in Kazakhstan is this constant um, uh, pattern by which the, the regime tends to do the bidding of the multinationals who operate in, 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 in Kazakhstan, or more generally, um, and I'm not a huge fan of the term, but more generally just imbibes totally the logic of neoliberal economics, right? And that's, and, and this grinds down to like really small mundane things like, you know, and I do try to document them in, in the book about how people are, um, you know, on, put on blacklists if in the in the oil regions, if they do not necessarily, if they show themselves to be um, prone to agitation, right, on the, on behalf of of their fellow workers, right, and end up on a blacklist, you can't get work. I mean, you can see that just the range of dirty tricks, kind of classic dirty tricks that are the stuff of politics, uh, and you know, at the local level, you know around the globe, but, um, you know, we like to think we've kind of moved away from in, in, in many contexts, but uh, certainly, certainly, um, and we may not be, have gotten away from it as much as we think, but nonetheless, they're really, really on display here. So in that context, this is the right question, right? How is it that we would expect the, um, you know, the, I mean, labor's weak, right? It's, it's just, it's weak, right? So, um, I try to um, thread the needle there by basically, because my question is a little bit different. My question is not, you know, is labor ab able to mount successful challenges um, to the existing order? Because uh, I think the jury's out. I think it's, it doesn't look good, um, but there's some surprising, you know, efficacy here and there um, that, that one could sort of begin to disentangle. But my actual question there was, why didn't, why haven't, or hadn't, and maybe it's changed since the, you know, since I stopped doing research on the book, 
But in general, labor mobilizers did not use the symbolic material that was available to them to try to further their cause. And I try to make the case that had they latched onto the United States as a symbol, that this would have helped them. I'm, I have no idea how much, right? And this is the problem with the negative case, right? Uh, you know, we can only begin to imagine alternative universes, but um, my claim is that that the you, that more than Russia, right, and its treatment of say migrant workers or or those who are, are on visas or more than any other single actor, the United States, you know, as a symbol presents an opportunity to link those who are involved in really local struggles to something much larger. And, you know, I, so you can, you can make the United States into the very symbol of neoliberal capitalism that is responsible for our local working conditions, which are terrible and deplorable and need to be changed just as they need to be changed in Bangladesh or they need to be changed in Cambodia or they need to be changed, you know, who knows in, in New York city. Right. So I think, so I try to make the case that there was a missed opportunity. I think, and I could be wrong. So, you know, um, I'll have to look. I think I, I, I'm, I'm pretty clear that I don't think this would have changed the, a lot of the outcomes. I don't think we would have seen, you know, a robust labor, you know, which would, it would have a receipt at the negotiating table. Um, you know, I don't think it changes a ton, but the puzzle to me is why mobilizers don't use the symbols that are available to them and have the potential for resonance. And uh, that's the case that, that, I, um, that I try to make. Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll just leave it there. There were some other things you said, but that, that's, uh, I have to think about the sort of myth of the American dream, how that plays in. Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess for kind of one more question before we turn it over to the more interactive Q and A, um, has to do with, um, public diplomacy. So in, in the conclusion of the book, you kind of talk about the prospects of, America being able to control the set, its own sediment through these public diplomacy channels. Um, and at least kind of my reading of it and based on your, the survey experiment that you did with focus groups, kind of you come to the conclusion that, you know, like, eh, not really. Like the US does not have a ton of leverage in controlling its image on, on being super intentional in the way that it um, shapes its perception um, in Central Asia. But, um, yeah, as, as a former Peace Corps volunteer, I'd be remiss not to talk about some of the other um, programs for public di diplomacy beyond the kind of embassy level. Um, uh, you know, that Peace Corps has operated in Kyrgyzstan since 1991. Thousands of volunteers, it, it operated in, um, I mean, it was in Kyrgyzstan until this spring when Globally, volunteers were pulled out of countries, but it had also operated in Kazakhstan until 2010, Turkmenistan until the early 2000s, Uzbekistan until 2005. Um, and even still traveling through the region, you're in a taxi and say that you're American and someone says, oh yeah, you know, my neighbor had a, an American girl living with them, a volunteer, and she was just the best. And, and we made Monte together and it was so delightful. And I learned about American traditions from her. Um, and, you know, I think um, to the extent of shaping symbolic America, that maybe the people who come into contact with Peace Corps volunteers or, you know, young people who participate in these educational exchange programs, whether they go to the U.S. for a year for high school as flex students um, or whether they go for university through the UGRAD program. But like these, these programs have like depth to them. And I wonder whether um, in terms of Kind of the way that you framed the the substantive chapters as about social movements and social or these kind of movements and the organizations that are driving um, the mobilization of of symbols um, that in focusing on this more organized social movements kind of ignoring the broader um, underlying channels of the of the extent of like which the U.S. maybe there's a certain ambivalence towards it, but there's I have. At least, like a, a certain fondness for American people, and maybe the like American the symbol of the U.S. government um, kind of has the the ambivalence of people can draw on that. You know, the U.S. is warmongering and is you know fighting in Afghanistan, but um, I had always been able to find that people really eagerly separated out symbols of politics and symbols of the government with you know the, the symbols of the more apolitical 
interpersonal relations. And, and that to me is, is where the US shines in public diplomacy. Um, and so it was kind of surprising not to see any mention of Peace Corps or these like educational programs in the book. Um, but so I guess um, to, to kind of drive this into a question of, you know, with like, to what extent, like, you know, you said that maybe the US, US is not in a huge position to shape the sediment, but, you know, through these programs and the, the programs that were able to make it past the Trump administration was kind of slashing these types of, of foreign aid and um, international programming. Um, like, do you see that uh, kind of more underlying, not outright support, but, you know, fondness or appreciation of the, the, the stories of, of Americans who've lived and traveled there, like how, how that type of public diplomacy might filter back up into high politics? Yeah, no, another great, um, great series of questions. And you're, you're absolutely right. I didn't, um, I didn't tackle that aspect of, of public diplomacy. So let's definitely, <laughs> let's definitely chat about uh, more about your experiences. Cause uh, um, I will say, you know, uh, I'm sure the Peace Corps draws on, if, if, let me put it this way, if the Peace Corps draws on volunteers like you, then that will actually put, you know, a terrific face on, you know, what Americans are. So I want, one, one can hope that, you know, all Peace Corps volunteers are as, um, are as positive and as engaging as Colleen Wood. So I'll, I'll just put it that way. Um, so the, the, I, th I think, let, let me actually be, go back to the question of you know, sort of social movements and social mobilization, because that is the, the focus of the sort of interior chapters of the book. I, I, I do uh, make the background claim that, you know, the, the U.S., if, through its public diplomacy, which is an intentional kind of image shaping activity, but also through all these sorts of unintentional ways by which it, it shapes its interest, it is affecting ordinary people as well, right? So the the there is a broader public that is not necessarily captured in those interior chapters, but that's the well from which social mobilizers draw, right? So, you know, as a um, as a human rights activist tries to um, develop some kind of local agenda, they may draw upon images of the United States. Uh, you know, certainly in the 90s and into the 2000s as, you know, the paragon of, of, of virtue uh, on, you know, political virtue and great defender of human rights. Sounds a little weird right now, but, but that's the shift that, that sort of the book documents. Um, and the reason that they're somewhat successful is that they can draw from the broader uh, public, which may have been exposed to Peace Corps volunteers uh, or to other aspects of, of, of the United States. Um, so it's these two things are not pristinely separate, but it's, which which makes your question really quite uh, quite a good one. Um, the what I I do tackle a couple of things that I think are consistent with your with your question, and you know I do this through the the survey experiment that's that's referenced in the end, and you know this is something that I did with uh, Renan Levine, and we did we did these these um, this exercise in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. We also did it in, in, in Kazakhstan, but the, the, for, for practical reasons, it, it kind of fell apart there. The data really weren't of, of, of the quality we needed. So, you know, we, so we did this in Tajikistan and, and Kyrgyzstan. And, um, you know, what we found were a, a couple of things and they're consistent with what we see in other kinds of contexts um, in, in literature that the scholarship calls framing. Um, and that is that, you know, the messenger really matters here, right? So it's one thing to say, you know, what you referenced er, uh, earlier in our discussion today, which is to say, you know, there, there are millions and millions of practicing Muslims in the United States, okay? To, to reference that, you know, should draw some kind of connection to a practicing Muslim in Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, right? It should, but as it turns out, and you know, our survey experiments really, uh, uh, I think demonstrated this and underscored the point, it matters who is delivering this message. So at the time, you know, if George Bush was attributed to a quotation about, you know, all the practicing Muslims in the, in the United States, at least at the time, this was, uh, this had the opposite effect. People started to wonder what was up, can't possibly be true, right? can't possibly be true that there are these practicing Muslims or there's something else going on. And so it, it actually had a negative effect, had the exact opposite effect. And, and, you know, the chapter goes into that. 
if you attributed this to the uh, to the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to to your country, to Kyrgyzstan or Tajikistan, same 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 framing, then um, people reacted um, also negatively, right? They're sort of like, oh, this is government, like something's going on here, right? They're just not viewed as credible actors, but they're actually viewed as actors that need to be resisted, at least by degree. Bush was much stronger, the the ambassador was was weaker, but the effect was pretty clear. But if you attributed this to an ordinary American who's been living in Kyrgyzstan, right, and we gave him a fictional name, then people like the Peace Corps volunteer, or at least consistent with what you're describing, you know, people sort of say, yeah, you know, that that makes sense. So I think people do disaggregate. They do make a distinction between government and let's say, you know, the American government and American people. I mean, we see this in public opinion polls, you know, from the Middle East, you know, pretty much everywhere, right? People make these kinds of distinctions, sometimes by issue areas, right? Some people are quite sophisticated in how they disaggregate the United States. Um, but to, but to get, getting to the question, which is, you know, can the US do anything uh, about shaping its image? The answer is, uh, if we're looking for short-term solutions, uh, the, clearly no, right? Clearly no. I don't think I say it that directly in the book, but that's my stance, okay? Clearly no, you can't do anything in, in the short term because the process by which these images shift, they're gradual. And it, had, it takes a concerted effort. And I know that, you know, I mean, whatever the great intentions of the Biden administration to re-engage the world, restore America's image, you know, uh, be a you know, good global citizen lead, right? Uh, in the proper sense of the word, you know, there are short political time horizons in US politics and it becomes very difficult to sustain something over the kind of period of time that would be needed here. But let me say what I think would be needed and you know, it's up to the policymakers to figure out how to make it work. You know, it, it, it's about developing a credible diplomatic core, credible in the sense that they've got the languages, they've got the cultural knowledge, uh, and they proceed from an ethic of caring about the populations that they're engaging with, right? Um, Obviously, they're, they're incredible challenges and not, not to sort of, you know, um, gloss over them in sort of you know, the work of diplomacy is, is, is challenging, but I think it starts from training people. And, you know, what we've seen is, you know, dramatically accelerated over the course of the Trump administration, but it really predates the Trump administration, is the evisceration of the State Department and the diplomatic corps, right? And so the, uh, the, the people who would have this kind of cultural and linguistic competency and could deliver a message credibly um, uh, are not necessarily, uh, well, there aren't as many of them, right? So, um, but it's not, how do you be, how, how are you credible? It's not just knowing a language and, and, and knowing, you have to be able to represent, you have to be able to translate what the United States is or represents or seeks or is doing into something that is intelligible and can be appreciated uh, by the, the, the people receiving the message. And there, I mean, you know, it's easy to say what, it, what, what needs to happen, incredibly challenging to do, but there, there needs to be a narrowing of the gap between what the US proclaims and what the United States does, right? So are we gonna be credible on human rights? Okay, if we wanna be credible on human rights, then we need to be consistent on human rights. And that means treating our allies the same way that we treat our enemies or our competitors on questions of human rights. So um, if it means uh, ratcheting down um, our rhetorical commitment, uh, as long as that can be articulated clearly, I think you, you need to be able to undermine the claim on the ground that's often made of US hypocrisy. And the only way to do that is to become more consistent with your own principles, even if you need to diminish the scope of your own principles um, in order to make it consistent. So uh, long haul stuff, but you know, um, since, since my next book will be in another 20 years, maybe I'll, maybe I'll, have, I'll be able to uh, you know, look back and, and have something to say on that score. Yeah, that's that's great. Thanks. I think it's it's interesting that you brought up specifically the example of you know if George Bush delivers the message, people are gonna say like no, this is a lie. If if an ambassador delivers the message, like no, this is also suspicious because I and I know you know anecdote is not data in the sense of it doesn't scale up, but I, I vividly remember sitting in in my kitchen with my host family in um, in northern Kyrgyzstan 
watching on TV as uh, Sheila Gwaltney, who was the ambassador from 2015 to 2017, was delivering, like, I think it must have been a New Year's message or something. And she did it in Russian, she did it in English, and then when she did it in Kyrgyz, my host mom freaked out. She said, oh my, this this woman is clean. She's awesome. She's she's great. Like, we love her. Like, how come you never said that your ambassador was this great before? And so I think that this does speak to, uh, you know, the power of learning a local language, especially in a context in a, in a bilingual country like Kyrgyzstan. Um, but maybe this is, you know, U.S. picking up on <laughs> the, the fact that people might have doubted the ambassador before. And okay, like, strategically, is there a way that we can use this figure who's super powerful and super public um, in a more strategic way. Um, but so I wanna ask one more question on, on human rights, which you brought up. Um, so I think here that maybe, you know, at first when I was reading the chapter on human rights, which is different than, than your other two chapters insofar as you don't kind of go into specific groups or specific organizations that are operating, but instead kind of talk about this professionalized advocate, this class of professionalized advocates um, who, um, you know, have take, received training, have received funding from, um, from the U.S. to, you know, really like become professionalized NGOs or like they're, they're good at being um, nonprofit organizations in a very American sense. Um, and so, you know, I think what was interesting is I was reading the chapter and uh, was kind of struggling to, to see in my experience in, in Kyrgyzstan and in Kazakhstan, how the kind of logic of social actors drawing on symbolic America to either improve their standing or, you know, by clinging to symbolic America, they suffer like trying to figure out how this mapped onto my experience. And I think what I realized was, you know, as someone who my first time to the region was in 2014, I lived there from 2015 to 2017 and have been back pretty often, but um, I have just, I've seen the tail end of your argument and have not seen, I like did not live in the region or had not been to the region in the nineties or two thousands when maybe the groups that, you know, were clinging to America, the, the symbol of America, you know, were thriving. And only by the time that I got there in, in the mid 2010s, had they had the, the kind of ecosystem of organization shifted. Because what I had seen was um, really encapsulated by um, the last sentence in, in your human rights chapter is, um, in the longer run, it may be that human rights activists who distance themselves from symbolic America will stand the best chance of success. And this really resonated with something that I heard in a conversation with Mohira Sirkulova, who's uh, an, an activist and a professor at the American University in Bishkek, that she was kind of describing, you know, my, my organization, the Bishkek Feminist Collective, like, of course, we don't take money from the US, like, of course, we don't take money from the National Endowment of Democracy, like, that would be suicide, like, we're already underdogs in, in Bishkek activist circles, like, why would we ever connect ourselves to the US, like, we don't need US feminists or US money to do our job. Um, and I like where before I, I, yeah, I think that this is really kind of encapsulating your argument and maybe, you know, you, you framed at the beginning that you're not in the business of predicting, but um, it really does seem that there is this, this kind of shift. But so my question for you is like, normatively, do you see this as a problem? Like, um, you know, does this shift in framing have an impact on human rights worldwide? Like, is it really a problem from the perspective of human rights conditions that the groups that are advocating really, really hard to improve women's equality, um, freedom of speech, stopping the, the work of um, jailing political activists, that these people aren't drawing on the US? Like, or is it ultimately fine? Like, is the prescription to this, like you, you had said, okay, maybe the US just needs to pull back on what it claims its values are. Um, and I, I wonder whether some reading the book might be like, and that's terrible, like what a shame, like the US has been, you know, this light on a hill for so many years. Um, but I guess I, I'm curious for your uh, perspective on, you know, like normally, do, normatively, does it really matter <laughs> if, um, mm -hmm. if, if groups are kind of pulling away from the US? Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's a great question. And um, I'll keep it reasonably short because I, I know we want to save time for um, other, other questions, but um, just going back to, your example from Northern Kyrgyzstan, the, uh, you know, your host family um, being impressed with the Kyrgyz language skills of the, of the, um, the ambassador, right? Um, uh, I, I, just one quick point, which is, it has to be genuine, right? It, like, if, if, if people are not stupid, 
people know, people can suss out when this is done cynically or when they really can't speak Kyrgyz, but they're just pronouncing the sounds. I mean, you know, they they know when they're being manipulated. And that's one of the things that comes across pretty clearly, I think, in, in some of this, uh, the work that was done for this book, but in also other work that I'm doing. Um, you know, we need to give people credit. So so it sounds like, I mean, my hypothesis would be that the ambassador was 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 sincere and proceeded from the proper you know ethic of caring. Um, and there I think it stands a chance of working. Um, to your question, uh, which is a really good one, um, does it matter, I guess, is the question that people can't draw upon the United States as a as a symbol, at least in the human rights community. I do think it matters. Um, I do think uh, it's it's not impossible to imagine some other kind of resonant symbol inspiring, uh, you know, people. But at, but at the moment, um, I don't think that you can just simply replace, let's say, you know, some kind of European model of human rights, and it will have the same kind of impact. And and the, and the reason I think gets back to the um, you know something that I think frames the the whole book which I think makes the United States stand out as a symbol, which is that the US really is for, you know, historically, you know, in spite of being the, the uh, you know, the exceptional country, right? US exceptionalism, it claims universality of its values, right? Um, more so than, than, than any other great power or any other middle, middle-sized power, right? And so I don't, I do think it matters certainly in the short term to, you know, if you can't, if you can't frame your efforts around some kind of universal principles that are um, embodied by this incredibly powerful leading country that, that embodies those principles, then I, then I think that, uh, I think that you are sort of cut off at the knees, you know, rhetorically. I mean, obviously there are plenty of reasons to advocate for human rights and it's not simply because, you know, the United States is present or absent um, and people are rightfully, uh, you know, will advocate almost spontaneously, I would say. But I think that that's probably not enough if you're trying to mount a sustained, um, kind of advocacy or activism that can actually put pressure on regimes that are committing abuses, for example. So great question. I mean, more, more could be said, but, um, but that's how I, I would start an answer. Great. Thanks to you both. I do want to get to some of the questions because they are excellent. And again, thank you for submitting your questions. Uh, and actually, I want to mention Peter Frankopan's question first, uh, when he asked about the best two or three practical steps new administration can take to put anti-Americanism right. I want you to both think about that because I know, Ed, you gave an answer to it that there is no quick fix. And I think for all the excellent reasons you mentioned, but also Colleen, and maybe we can, you know, as we close, if there are any kind of American policymakers on, uh, uh, you know, on the Zoom right now to just think about some, just some practical guidance or, or implications with that. Um, I want to start, uh, Kelly Lang asks a question that Ed, you have struggled with this too in a capacity, I think, of, 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 of you know, your, your presidency of the, the Central Eurasian Studies Society. And that is, uh, she asks, I'm not an academic, but I was curious, practically speaking, does writing unflattering comments, justified comments about autocratic governments eventually limit your freedom to pursue your studies um, in that region? So I think we'd, we'd all be interested in your, your latest thoughts on that. Yeah, so um, uh, let me tackle that second question uh, first. Does writing things that are unflattering about the region uh, curtail access? I mean, um, potentially. Um, I, I've, I've always been of the perspective that I um, should be able to engage with a variety of actors. Um, and I, you know, I don't have to agree with them. There are lots of... Uh, uh, let's just leave them unnamed, unsavory characters that you know you encounter in in the who you know they, they may have conspiracy theories, they may be um, they may be racist or anti-Semitic or all these kinds of things, and you know uh, I don't think that that should keep us from engaging with people. Now the question was really about the other end, right? Does it does you know uh, when you publish a book does it does it have an effect on how you're received on the uh, when you say try to return to the field? Um, and I would think so. I would think that uh, that that it will. How is pretty unpredictable, though. Um, and so I, I don't think that academics or others who are in the business of writing um, or analyzing um, uh, these kinds of things 
should pull punches. I think they should say things the way that they um, that they, they see them, and then try to not not necessarily try to be deeply critical. But uh, if if criticism is warranted, I think that they shouldn't shy away from that because you can't predict. You may have access curtailed, as a number of my colleagues have had with you know visa denials in Russia, apparently for nothing. Right. Um, and, and and it can go the other way, you know. And so, Alex, you were referring to um, a case where, you know, uh, the, a then PhD student was incarcerated just because someone somewhere had decided that he was a spy. Right. Um, you know, on the basis of zero. Right. And so I think these things can change on a dime. Um, it's a pretty shifting atmosphere. And so I, all that I think counsels is you know, do the best work that you can and let things, you know, uh, fall where they may. That said, easy for me to say, right, Colleen? I mean, you know, um, if I don't get access to the field again in some of these places, then, um, and, and please don't deny me a visa, but, uh, you know, I, then, uh, you know, I'm okay. Somebody starting their career really has to, has to think about this um, because it's a practical issue. And, you know, unless you want to end up doing work on totally different contexts, uh, assuming field work continues to matter for you, uh, you have to think um, at least you have to have one eye to the practical uh, there for sure. Great, thanks. Um, Isabel DeSisto has asked a few different questions. Um, we may not get to all of them, but I do want to ask her question, and, and this is for both of you. Uh, the, what is the role of the media in shaping citizens' perceptions of symbolic America, and particularly what media? Um, Colleen, you're so immersed in Central Asian social media and depictions and uh, online activism. Uh, I'm wondering whether there might be, you know, to, to parse this out even, um, you know, differences between um, the kind of, you know, official TV, um, national TV, Sputnik beaming, uh, beaming in, and then the kinds of social media themes that are being drawn uh, on. And I know it's difficult to generalize, but if you have any examples, I think that would be, um, um, you know, really, uh, you know, really interesting for us to uh, to hear about some of the, these different filters and portrayals. Um, do, you, do you want to start with that, Colleen? And then we'll go to Ed. Yeah, sounds good. Um, so I guess I'll start. I guess with an anecdote that's not from Central Asia specifically, but from from Russia. And that I talk once a week with a young woman in St. Petersburg, and we always start our conversation with like, okay, what is what does the news say about the U.S.? What does the news say about Russia? And like, what's actually going on right now? So, and it's always interesting, you know, like what I see going on in New York sometimes shows up in newspapers or the the things that she reads in Russia, but other times doesn't. So when we were having you know, massive protests this summer uh, after George Floyd's death that did not really appear in local media. But, um, you know, this last week as Texas was without electricity and as without water, that was in the media in, in Russia. And I think that there's a kind of similar dynamic um, in, in Central Asia that, you know, like symbolic America is not, su I, don't, I don't see it super present in, at least in, in Kyrgyzstani or Kazakhstani um, TV or radio, and and even in radio as a thook, like the the Radio Free Europe branch in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, like are not really pushing a, a vision or like mentioning the U.S. Um, a ton. Um, but I think it's been interesting watching um, how those protests have been picked up. At least protests in the U.S. have been picked up by. Um, groups who have large followings on social media. So some of these um, protest movements that have major Instagram accounts or have big tele, tele, um, TikTok accounts or Telegram channels are kind of using images of the US public um, mobilizing and protesting on behalf of uh, Black Lives Matter. And kind of, it's been interesting to watch the manipulation of that a symbol into something that's resonant locally. Um, I think there've been a whole bunch of panels this month on race and identity in the region, but I, I don't think like the idea of Black Lives Matter was not resonant because like black people in Central Asia need to be protected. But it was interesting to watch that it was it really turned into a thing about police brutality and drawing on the way that police brutality in the US is evil and bad. And hey, we also have this here. So seeing in an Instagram post a carousel of pictures of, you know, protesters being tear gassed in Portland, of being beaten in New York, and then the next slide is protesters being tear gassed and beaten in Almaty or Astana. Um, I think that in a similar way that, you know, 
there's this kind of div growing division between state and society, even in the US, that the way that uh, kind of traditional media is drawing on those images is super different than the way that protest movements are, are drawing on that and using um, social media platforms to kind of push a very different angle of what symbolic America is, that it's not really top down um, curated by the State Department or curated by the president. It's really these, these uh, the, the social movements in the US are providing the stuff uh, of it. Ed, same to you. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, uh, Colleen knows more than, I, more than I do on this on this score. I would just add um, that, you know, there, there clearly is a disproportionate influence in, within Central Asia of, of Russian media. And it's not, it can be indirect, right? Um, uh, and of course, there, there, there are a lot of moving parts here, but what, but what gets picked up by the Russian media eventually, sometimes in translation directly, um, ends up in, in, in local traditional media sources. Social media is, is a much more challenging thing to study, so I'll just defer to, to, Colleen, to Colleen on that. But I wouldn't be surprised if, if given the size of, you know, the, the Russian language social media audience, if there isn't a similar kind of, um, flow that's a little bit you know uh depictions of the rest of the world uh come sort of as filtered through russian media at least that's been the sort of traditional traditional pattern um and i think colleen is is absolutely right i mean one of the things that um you know maybe it's punting i don't know but i you know one of the things that makes it so hard to predict how these things play themselves out is that the, the things that get picked up locally are not necessarily the things you want right it may be you know, so, you know, government's interested in, in public diplomacy, and this gets to Peter Frankopan's, you know, question in, in a way, the things that, you know, controlling the image is, is really, you can only control one very small part of, of the image. You, you can't control how Black Lives Matter protests are then picked up in Central Asia or in Nigeria, right, with the sort of anti-police brutality kind of, uh, kind of discourse, or even like the insurrection, right? I mean, certainly not a proud moment in the United States, but also not one that you particularly massage in any way, especially because it travels immediately around the globe. And, and so your, your opportunity for shaping the, the message on this is just, is kind of gone, um, you know, even before it appears. So, um, and then more could be said, I mean, one, one other thing just to, to mention quickly on the media score, because, um, or on the sort of media environment thing is how these anti-fake news, um, <laughs> uh, legislations are being picked up, right? So the discourse of fake news, of course, has its own dynamic in the uh, in 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 the West, in the U.S. or in, in Canada, and yet picked up by autocrat or autocratic leaning um, regimes in uh, in in the region. You know, they they too want to be against fake news. They want to be against fake news because they want to you know control uh, information about vaccines. Well, this becomes a you know a broad net uh, dragnet for you know basically uh ensnaring your political opponents right and that's a well-worn strategy in the region but the specifics are um are, are really interesting i think that's great uh next i want to go to uh, roshan uh, jandaeva who asked a very interesting question about the emergence of organized pro-democracy youth-led social movements in kazakhstan and kyrgyzstan as opposed to other countries and uh, the question is, how can these movements employ the U.S. as a symbol for their political agenda, either as a beacon of democracy or as another example of excessive force used by law enforcement? I think that's the sort of the contemporary framing that, that we were just talking about. So, uh, and I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, and then we can go to Colleen. Sure. Um, so, yeah, no, like Oyan Kazakhstan and, and, and things like that. I mean, these are... These are fascinating in a variety of ways. And, and you know, I mean, this is the thing about sort of um, social mobilization for, you know, human rights and, and, and free elections is that, you know, we tend to, we tend to, it, 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 has, it has started to be disassociated from the, from the United States in any kind of Western model in a way that I think this is a potentially a very good long-term development, right? The reason that you want free and fair elections and human rights protections is because you want free and fair elections and human rights protections. You're not pursuing a geopolitical agenda. You're not aligning with the United States. You just don't want people killed or tortured, right? You want to have voice in your own government. And so I think that there's a I mean, there's an appetite for this and we and we know this, but it becomes very hard to disentangle um, the the sort of 
claim that there's some kind of you know U.S. support behind any kind of uh, pro-democracy uh, mobilization. So, but this is curious. I mean, the youth mobilization is, is is curious in part because you know to call it organized is um, I don't know maybe too strong, or maybe you don't need organization in the same way that you that you used to need organization. And we certainly see this, you know, in the I mean, actually going back to sort of the you know the the Arab uprisings, Tunisia, Egypt, and and so on. We see that there you know, a lot of the things that that um, social movement scholars would have called precursors for mobilization just didn't exist there, right? The kind of levels of organization didn't exist there, and yet people took to the streets. Uh, you know, to some, you know, uneven effect, but nonetheless, people can mobilize without a strong organization. And this has to do with the coordinating functions, I think, of social media um, and, uh, and, and the dynamics there. Um, but to the question, you know, how can they employ the U.S. as a symbol for their political agenda, either as a beacon of democracy or as an example of excessive force? I, I think Colleen mentioned, you know, my stance in the book, and I'll just I'll just repeat it, which is to say, I think they're better off without the U.S. at this moment, right? I think that distancing themselves from the United States at this moment, and I don't pretend to project this moment, you know, forward, you know, indefinitely, but for this moment, and I, you know, that's going to go on for a while. Um, I think better to distance themselves from the United States as a source of inspiration, better to maybe hitch their wagon to perhaps some notion of European democracy if they need, or maybe just, you know, treat it as a purely local kind of uh, kind of issue that should be taken on local terms. I think that that may limit the scope of the mobilization, but I think it's probably the practical solution for, for groups like this right now. Yeah, and I, I would add to that, that, you know, Rajan, you ask like whether this is just a function of the regime's repressiveness. And I do think that that is doing a lot of work, but I think also that there's a certain contingency to these groups showing up. So Oyan Kazakhstan formed after the 2019 presidential elections or kind of around that moment, Bashtan Bashta formed the day after the kind of the crisis that unfolded um, after the October 2020 elections in Kyrgyzstan. And so I think we just haven't seen that type of like big political moment. I mean, there were presidential elections in, in Tajikistan, yes, but um, in Uzbekistan, you know, the, the pres first presidential elections since, you know, under Mirziyoyev's reform efforts are coming up later this year. So if we were going to see some sort of an emergence of organized uh, pro-democracy, youth-led social movement, I think that we would see that later in 2021 or some like connected to the, the elections. Um, but I think, yeah, here the, the end point of like, maybe the US is really not the best um, strategic move for these groups to be building their um, kind of symbolic uh, or discursive repertoires around. And I think here is where like regional learning comes into play. So, you know, it's interesting watching the, the tone and the, the message of groups like Oyan and Bashtan Bashta, that they're watching each other, they're mimicking each other. You know, Bashtan Bashta, it was at first a group in Kazakhstan called Masa Media that was putting out like word of the day and kind of educating viewers on the, the ins and outs of the civil code of, uh, what is it what is the process of impeachment what is the process of elections what are primaries like the doing the work of civic education and it's been interesting to watch Bashtan Bashta kind of mimic that and copy that so if anything I think the groups in um, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan are probably watching their neighbors rather than looking to the U.S. looking to um, American social movements um, but then the last thing that I want to add on this is kind of beyond regional learning for pro-democracy organizations is kind of the trajectory based on issue area. So I think that there is a certain like level building blocks of you know, what type of organizations or social movements get are allowed to operate. And then once you kind of have that organizational structure in place, it's easier to flip that into pro-democracy organize, organizing. I mean, we even saw this in Kazakhstan, Oyan Kazakhstan, didn't come out of nowhere. A lot of the leaders of this group were, were involved in eco organizing, um, both in just like Almaty specifically, but, but broader in Kazakhstan around environmental issues. Uh, in Kyrgyzstan, a handful of the, the, the people, the core volunteers of Bashtan Bashta were really involved in feminist organizing and around gender. And both this kind of gender and environmental organizing are often seen as like less threatening from a repressive regime's perspective. I don't think that that's true, but like traditionally that's, that's um, 
what's happened. And so I think that if we start to see these kind of environmental or gender um, protests or movements starting to build up, that that's how you get the, the basis of pro-democracy. And what I think is interesting is that we're starting to see that, at least in, in Tajikistan with gender, um, that there is like a growing kind of space on Instagram and Facebook where people are talking about um, women's equality, sexual harassment, um, and like problems with patriarchy in the Tajik experience. And, and in Uzbekistan, I think we're seeing environmental consciousness come into play with, you know, how water draining cotton production is with the dam that broke earlier this year, uh, earlier in 2020. So I think that the, the pieces are starting to come into play. So I don't think that it's, you know, a problem per se that there hasn't been these huge youth led social movements yet in other parts of Central Asia, that, but the pieces are starting to align in a way that we might see that later this year. Terrific. I want to get to one more question. I'm going to combine some and ask each of you for about a, a minute, minute and a half answer. Um, and this comes from uh, Russell Gayushev's uh, uh, question, as well as uh, Isabel DeSisto was asking this, um, as well as Grady Vaughn. And of course, we're going to, uh, of course, I'm going to ask you a little bit about geopolitics, but perceptions about China. And Ed, I, I mean, it's not in terms of is China popular or is unpopular, but um, we know it's unpopular, right? From every survey that we've seen, and we know actually too that in places like Western Kazakhstan, perceptions of China have turned way negative over the last decade. Um, but the question is between this, this, this space you're exploring and, and which I really like the way Colleen sort of talked about the co-constitution of state and society. What would be the implication of Schatz's kind of anti-Americanism approach to possibly understanding you know, the constraints uh, in limits of how Central Asian states might deal with China uh, going forward. Have you, have you thought about this in a comparative way? And Colleen, uh, maybe we'll start with you, maybe if you want to take, not that general question, Grady's question about U.S. advocacy for Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and other persecuted groups in Xinjiang. Um, will they fall flat in Central Asia due to the original U.S. invention of the global war on terror frame? I know you've been tracking very closely the question of Kazakh co-nationals um, in Xinjiang, and I Wondering if you have any up-to-date thoughts to share with us um, about that advocacy and how it's shaping or not shaping Kazakh public opinion. So maybe we'll start with Colleen there and we'll end with Chats. And then I want to come back to the, the policy prescription before we sign off. Great. Yeah. So I think that this question on advocacy for Xinjiang is, is compli complicated, as, as all things are. But so on the one hand, yes, you have the U.S. invention of this idea of global war on terror, which justifies not only China, China, like rhetorically has been drawing on anti-terror as a reason to explain and justify the existence of the of these kind of like the genocidal policies in um, in eastern Turkestan. But um, from the but then the U.S. on the other hand is one of the only countries worldwide that is passed bills locally, um, kind of uh, putting sanctions on China, denouncing the, the treatment of Muslims in Xinjiang. Um, and I think that at least in, from what I've been following in, in Kazakhstan, that these groups are not drawing on the US directly um, to either point out, ah, it was your fault to begin with that you came up with the global war on terror, or, oh, the US is one of the only countries kind of working to draw attention to this. Um, what I've seen is playing with different identity frames in order to draw on different audiences. So kind of the way that, Ed, in the book, you talk about these multiple types of framings to explain how and when like labor organizations did or didn't um, succeed. We've seen at least Atajur, the main group that's advocating for ethnic Kazakhs, has kind of played with different um, framings and, and emphasizing different types of identity, um, none of which really have to do with the US. So on the one hand, they're emphasizing that they are ethnic Kazakhs trying to draw on that sympathy that Kazakhstan framed itself as a state that cares about all Kazakhs regardless of border. On the other hand, they're drawing on Kazakhstaniness of like, look, we, we may have been born in China, but we have passports and our, our family is um, owed passports. And neither of these really worked in drawing attention from, from the broader local population in, in Kazakhstan. What I found in, in analyzing their YouTube channel is that there's this kind of third branch of, of anti-Chinese pro-Islam framing, that those are the videos with the most views, those are the videos with the most comments of kind of this really xenophobic framing of like, 
you know, Chinese men are trying to marry Kazakh women to turn them into Chinese. Um, awful things about Chinese are, um, you know, not Muslim and, and therefore this is why we should be fighting for them. Um, so in terms of US advocacy, I think here too, it's like the US as a, as a symbol is not really being drawn upon. Um, that this could be, yeah, another example that kind of fits into Ed's book of the, the way that the US has kind of fallen um, strategically for these organizations. Great. Ed, to you. Okay, I'm just unmuting. Yeah, no, that's that's really um, just building on some of the things that 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 Colleen was saying. I mean, I think that you know, in I don't think the book is of historical interest only. I mean, I think that potentially there's uh, there's something there going forward. But we are in in a moment where um, if you want to critique, if you want to make a critique of existing uh, affairs of the status quo, there may be some symbolic resources in, in linking up to you know a global critique of the United States, right? Um, but it doesn't really happen the op the opposite way, which is why I'm I, I, you know anti americanism is a, is a tricky term, but I'm comfortable enough with it that um, because I think we're in a particularly kind of you know a moment where global critiques of the United States have a have, have a real resonance and then that and that resonance can play itself out locally. Um, but I'm not surprised. I think that the 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 um, you know it's very tricky to figure out your strategic play if you are advocating on behalf of Uyghurs in Central Asia because guess what? so many forces align against it. And it's really quite tragic that way. Uh, the US or now Canada taking a principled stance against, against genocide, you know, I mean, we can talk about the, the impact of that, but given the disengagement of the West from the region and given the increasing leverage that China has in, in global politics, it just becomes such a hard road to hoe. And so um, I'm not sure what could be done to sort of, you know, on, on a symbolic front or any other kind of uh, front uh, at, at the moment, or at least nothing, nothing particularly quickly. Um, I mean, Alex's question, question about China, you know, could this approach work with thinking about China is, I mean, something that I'm starting to look into because we've got a project here that I'm doing with uh, Rachel Sylvie at, um, at my university where we're looking at the effect. It's a slightly different, you know, project, but it's about the Belt and Road and its impact um, across Eurasia and then Asia, Southeast Asia, um, South Asia, East Asia, right? And I, we're already seeing a, a ton of variety of sort of the ways in which like the Belt and Road and its impact are, are imagined, but that's really the main vehicle. That's the main sort of, you know, way in which China is seen on the ground is through these sort of infrastructure projects. Sometimes personnel, you know, people, you know, working, uh, building roads and things like that. But, but typically that's the, where the visibility comes about. But China is a, you know, it's interesting because at least for the moment, I know Alex has written, you know, brilliantly about this with, with Dan Nexon, but the, you know, at least for the moment, China continues to claim that its rise is a peaceful one, right? It's not imposing its model upon anybody. I mean, the reality is gonna be different, right? Um, but symbolically, I think this matters, or how China plays itself out as a symbol, I think is going to look different than how the U.S. plays itself. Again, back to something I said earlier, you know, the U.S. will claim universality of its, of its principles, and therefore, at least theoretically, it's something that anyone can link up to, right? With China, it's a little bit different. The claim, again, I'm emphasizing that the reality on the ground, you know, your experience may differ, may differ from this, but is that, um, is that, is that China tries to lie low, right? it tries to be out of these kinds of things, whereas the US seems to embrace its sort of principled involvement in lots of different things. So that leads to a different discourse. And I think we're starting to see this here where the where um, now you see allegations of Chinese hypocrisy, right? That China is not, is not the, the peaceful, it's not the peaceful rise. It's not that they're simply trying to help us and offering offering us, um, you know, interest free loans or, you know, debt forgiveness or, you know, whatever it, it, it may be. Um, and yet China is a neighbor. Right. So it's there's there is at the same time a language of and yet there's nothing we can do, really. Like it's natural for your neighbor to be involved, right? So, so if you know Russia is the devil, the devil we know because we all lived through the Soviet period. Uh, China is the is the devil you may not know very well and you can't control, 
right? Like we can't do anything about it. It's natural that China would be involved. And so I don't know if this is consistent with what Colleen or Alex have, have experienced or, or, or heard about or others, you know, who are still with us, but, you know, it leads to, there's, a, we're at a moment of profound cynicism. It's sort of like, well, China's there. It's, this is a, you know, um, it's a main driver of this sort of age of impunity and, you know, poster child, you know, a million Uyghurs, um, you know, in, incarcerated essentially in, uh, in these so-called uh, re-education camps, the the you know, but there's nothing we can do about it, right? So we're at this moment of sort of deep, deep cynicism. I mean, I think it's a, I, I like to think we're at the low point, or maybe the high point in terms of cynicism, <laughs> uh, the low point in terms of hope. Um, but you know, we'll see how uh, a bunch of different things shake out. Um, I know the Biden administration would like to have it a slightly different way. We'll see how that works. That is a, a super interesting answer to that question. So we are over time. So I do want to come back, though, to like the one pragmatic thing. Um, I will give one, uh, which is, um, you know, I think it's really important in this era of reengaging in advocacy to put a public frame that these issues are ones that we struggle with here in the U.S. A, because it's true, and B, because it's just so obvious, right? When we talk about questions of democracy and corruption and nepotism and cynicism. And I think that's something that we've been very reluctant to do before for political reasons, but I think it's just the most obvious way forward to sort of admit that these things are difficult, right? That they're constant struggles and that, um, you know, there's, you know, you know th 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 there's a sense that, you know, we can be in this together, um, you know, uh, both, you know, over there, quote unquote, you know, in Central Asia, wherever we're engaged, as well as back in the state. So that's my one piece of advice. Uh, Colleen, to you. Yeah, you know, I think my one piece of advice is to get high level people out to the region to do these like big showy spectacly visits um, that the region is objectively ignored, like that John Kerry's visit was a huge deal back in 2015. And even then he spent like three hours or something in Kaz in Kyrgyzstan and, and people noticed that they're paying attention to visits from the US so in this whole question of like, is, is the US or losing its grip to China or to Russia? Like, yeah, if you don't go and pay attention and make a show of it, like, yes, like people are paying attention to these high level visits and, you know, it's some of the only countries in the world that have never hosted a US president. Um, I don't know that Biden is like rushing to, to go visit Astana or Nur Sultan, but um, I, I would see these kind of high level visits of doing a lot of work in terms of um, like public um, perception of, of the US and its leaders. Great, thanks. And Ed, final word to you. Sure, no, that's great. I mean, I guess uh, I agree with agree with everything. I would I would you know say in addition to locking in or in addition to redoubling the commitment to engagement, whether it's high level or whether it's funding the Peace Corps, renegotiating the the reentry of the uh, the Peace Corps, or other kinds of programs. Um, the commitment needs to be redoubled, but it also needs to be locked in somehow. I don't know what that looks like in terms of U.S. domestic politics and you know convincing taxpayers that they need to fund these kinds of things, but. Uh, you know, one thing I try to chart out in the book is that it, not doing it has an impact, right? We need to, we need to, um, we need to to do it because not doing it is eventually, I would suggest, more costly. I really like Alex's frame at the end, and actually, it reminds me that uh, that I was going to say something briefly about corruption. Um, uh, I think you said it better than 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 than, than I could, but I would just add this: um, people are going to talk about corruption, and they already are, right? It's like corruption seems to be a, a terrific way to talk about, um, you know, whatever ails you, right? And, and, and there's so many, obviously, problem, and the problem of corruption is, is quite, quite widespread um, anywhere. Making it credible, making any discussion of corruption, any framing about it would have to talk very honestly about, you know, how it plays itself out in established context and that it, you need to be vigilant about these kinds of things and the stuff that Alex and, and, and uh, John Heathershaw have written about or um, Sherman and, and these sorts of things, like it's globalized, right? So we've got these networks that, are, so taking a clear stance on that is essential, but it's also practical, right? It's also practical in the sense that people are gonna wanna fight corruption. They're gonna find the language of fighting corruption. Uh, if it's if not through democracy in that language, right? Uh, not if it's not transparency and um, and fair elections that are going to help to to take a bite out of corruption, then well, it must be you know some idea of 
authority, the strong hand, right? So, you know, interestingly, you get the Japarovs of this world saying that they're fighting corruption. Well, uh, you know, remains to be seen. I'll just put it that way. But but the claim can be made, and then people can take a flyer on this guy who gets out, you get gets out of jail and becomes president, right? Because they'll say, well, nobody else is fighting corruption. Let this guy try it, right? Or you can get remember the Taliban. This was their claim to fame, right? So, I think you're absolutely right, Alex. Corruption is is probably a better language, a better framing, and maybe slight distancing from the language of democracy because it's become so tarnished. Um, over the past couple of decades. What do you have to lose? And that's sort of a popular <laughs> theme, right? Okay. Uh, thank you both. This was amazing. Thank you, Colleen, for the super thoughtful questions, deep engagement with the book. Ed, thank you for uh, joining us at this early time. Thank you to all the audience, everyone watching also over YouTube and watching this in delay. And good luck with the book. I forgot to plug it, but here it is, right in the camera. Um, Slow Anti-Americanism, Social Movements and Symbolic Politics in Central Asia. Uh, and hope to see everyone very soon, uh, um, certainly over Zoom, and hopefully in person as well at some point. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Colleen.